Now we'll move on to our second Q&A and discussion session, and I invite uh, Drs. De Michel, Pratt, Woodward, and Steckline uh, to join, join us for this session. Um, we want to uh, remind everyone that this uh, meeting has had great participation and support. We have almost 900 registrants from 47 countries who are attending. Uh, so thank you for, for supporting and listening. Uh, we will start uh, this session uh, with some cases and also take chat questions in between cases uh, like we did for the first uh, Q&A. So we'll start with our uh, first case. So this is uh, uh, case one, is a 46-year-old premenopausal woman uh, who undergoes a skin-sparing mastectomy with immediate uh, subglandular implant-based reconstruction and sentinel lymph node biopsy for a clinical T2, 3.5-centimeter, uh, node-negative, a grade one, uh, ER-positive, HER2-negative uh, breast cancer in upper outer quadrant of her left breast. Uh, Intra-op frozen section of the lymph node was negative, but on final pathology, two of four central lymph nodes were involved with the largest metastasis measuring three millimeters without extranodal extension. There was no LVI and final, final surgical margins were widely negative. Uh, so you know, in this patient, in terms of systemic therapy, uh, would one consider gene expression test to aid adjuvant chemotherapy decision? Uh, what about ovarian function suppression? Um, what does the panel think uh, uh, about uh -huh. substituting that uh, for chemotherapy in this patient? And I know Angie covered a lot of this very complex topic uh, very well in her talk. So um, uh, Angie, do you want to start uh, with your thoughts on this uh, particular subject? Sure. Um, thank you. And thanks for having me. This is a great program. I mean, I think this is a really common scenario that we see. This is a very high risk lesion um, with two positive lymph nodes in a premenopausal woman. And so, as I discussed earlier, uh, the ARC sponder data would apply here in that there really is no role for the um, recurrence score, the oncotype recurrence score, or really any other gene expression test to aid us in decisions because uh, patients who are premenopausal benefited regardless of their recurrence score from adjuvant chemotherapy. So I think here you're going to give adjuvant, you're going to recommend adjuvant chemotherapy regardless. And a question that came up during my session, you know, about this. And, you know, so it does sort of beg the question of whether would you even order a recurrence score in this patient? I think if you, you know, wanted to get some sort of an estimate of recurrence risk, you could do it, but it isn't going to be needed for decision making. Um, and then in terms of the ovarian function suppression, you know, we just don't have the data yet to know whether that is really what is responsible for the benefits that we see from chemotherapy. Is it that we are making women amenorrheic? Um, but there does seem to be some hint from the, uh, from the post hoc analysis that was done of the our expander data that there does seem to be some additional benefit to chemo over and above ovarian function suppression. And I think there, there is going to be a large randomized trial um, in North America to address this uh, in the coming years, because this is a really important question that we don't know the answer to. So this time, I think the patient still needs the adjuvant chemotherapy and given her age and her level of risk, I would probably also give her ovarian function suppression along with her endocrine therapy. Thank you. Dr. Pratt, uh, any additional thoughts? Not really. I think Angie entered this uh, marvelous. Uh, I, I completely agree with what she, she said. Um, it is true that here in Europe, we also have key 67 in, usually, but in this scenario, even with low key 67s, I would still um, go for chemo uh, in this scenario. I would not order uh, a gene expression prognostic uh, test like like Oncotype or, or others. And regarding the ovarian function suppression, fully fully agree. I, I am still not convinced that we can use that treatment strategy to to avoid uh, chemotherapy. And that's you know, and and hence the need for a well designed trial to address that question. Uh, uh, it's uh, obviously a tempting approach to consider, uh, uh, but you know we've made a lot of progress in improving outcomes for these young women with breast cancer. So uh, any step at scaling back uh, has to be very thoughtful. Um, so you know, in, in the same patient as we think about local regional mm -hmm. therapy, what additional local regional therapy uh, 
would you recommend for this patient? Uh, it, she's had two out of four sentinel lymph nodes that are positive uh, and, and is relatively young. Um, and here are the potential choices. Of course, it's not limited to these choices. Uh, so Wendy, what are your thoughts um, on how you would approach uh, this patient's local regional management? Yeah, so this is an interesting patient. I think that most people would probably offer this patient post mastectomy radiation with two um, positive nodes and a um, not T1 um, tumor. But it's possible if she had a recurrent score that she would be eligible for Taylor RT, which is randomizing patients who have low nodal burden um, to radiation versus not. So if that was a low score, the retrospective data from NSABP would suggest the local failure risk is low. Um, and then the juxtaposition is the MA20 and the EORTC22922 data that shows even some high risk node negative patients are benefiting from post mastectomy radiation. So I, I think, and I'm curious what Dr. Steckline thinks that many people nationally would be offering this patient post mastectomy radiation today, um, but it would be great to have more sort of biology based data about whether or not from a radiation standpoint, this patient um, may be adequately treated now. Um, the question about the sentinel node would come into this discussion as well. This is a patient who hasn't had an axillary lymph node dissection and has had a mastectomy, which of course is not um, what the um, Z11 trial addresses. Um, so that piece of it would come up maybe as leaning towards offering it because you could include the axilla. Certainly if you're gonna offer that patient radiation, you would include the axilla. I think that's what most people would do, but it's conceivable this patient would be eligible. And um, and the question in the chat asked, you know, about uh, the implant being there as as a potential uh, uh, factor in decision making, um, uh, in, and you know, of course, you brought up the participation in clinical trial and oncotype related to that. So, um, Shane, do you want to do you want to address those those two aspects? And I know in these situations, oftentimes we're saying we're going to give chemo anyways, so we're not going to order it. So if you if you would like it for some local therapy decisions or trial eligibility, let's do it after we've already made the decision for chemo so it doesn't uh, confuse all of us. Yeah, I agree with Dr. Woodward entirely. I think the default would be to recommend PMRT in this patient, you know, based on the MA20 and EORTC data, we really have not found a, a group of women where we have good data saying that in the node positive setting, you're not going to benefit from radiation. The interesting thing about both of those trials is the vast majority of patients got complete axillary dissections. The vast majority of patients got aggressive systemic therapy. And even in that setting where most of the patients had relatively low volume nodal disease, there is still a benefit to radiation. Um, I would agree getting an oncotype in this patient would be helpful for MA39. Um, but Dr. Woodward actually did a, a really nice analysis of one of the SWOG data sets that already shows us that probably the oncotype can be predictive for both local regional recurrence and may help us make decisions for radiotherapy as well. Um, the one thing I would, I'd like to see how Dr. Woodward feels is that the, the MA39 trial does not require an axe dissection. And so in breast conserved patients where we know they're gonna be getting whole breast radiation anyways, part of the axilla will get radiated. Would it make you uncomfortable to enroll a patient on MA39 who has node positive disease where you have not had an axe dissection and they may get no radiation whatsoever to the low axilla. Um, that's one question. And then for the implant, um, you know, we know that there's a risk of capsular contracture. We know that there's a risk of implant complications whenever we do radiation. But I think with really thoughtful radiation planning and potentially using advanced techniques like IMRT or VMAT, um, we're now in a better place where we can address some of the difficult anatomical challenges in our reconstruction patients better than we were able to say 10 or 15 years ago. I definitely agree with that. I mean, you would just have to do the best you can about the fact that the implant is there and there are a number, number of strategies to try to nuance that a little bit, uh, but for sure you would consent the patient to have capsular contracture because it is likely um, that that's going to happen. I do agree today, we aren't that comfortable, um, not with a patient who's had that sentinel lymph node biopsy positive, no ax dissection and no radiation to the axilla. Um, I have not seen the Synodar 1 um, paper come out where 20% of those patients had mastectomy. 
um, and they have good radiation details. So it'll be interesting to look at, at that subset, but today we don't have that data. And I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with that. I think another question related to uh, hypofrac uh, and implant and presence of implant, uh, would that uh, impact your decision uh, about that? I think we're still gathering data, at least in North America about, or at least in the US, probably Canada is doing some more of this about any patient that you're gonna treat regional nodal irradiation with hypofractionation. So I think this patient would be offered either standard fractionation or trial participation for something that's shorter. And then the implant would be a complicating factor. There are some single institution series where people have not seen worse contracture, worse issues with the hypofractionated regimen. So I think ultimately that's going to end up being okay. But today, probably this patient would be offered six weeks of radiation. So nice to see consensus among our experts uh, on both local and systemic therapy uh, uh, questions, and uh, we don't always get that. So uh, this is great. Uh, let's move on to the next case. So this is a 52-year-old uh, uh, lady with T2 and 0 ERPR positive, HER2 negative, grade 2 uh, invasive ductal cancer. She's nearing completion of five years of uh, her AI. She's tolerated this. Uh, relatively well, except for osteopenia, which is managed uh, well with a uh, yearly reclass. Uh, so in terms of the next steps, uh, would you extend endocrine therapy beyond five years uh, for her um, and or consider using some sort of gene expression assay to help in that decision making? And if the decision is made to extend the endocrine therapy, uh, how long should it be? Uh, three or five years or two years? Uh, this is again, a situation that we encounter uh, quite commonly uh, in clinic. Um, I'll, I'll look to Angie to address this first. Yeah, I agree with you. This is a very common scenario. Um, and I think in general, my approach to patients um, and extended endocrine therapy um, would limit that to patients who had positive lymph nodes or higher risk disease than this patient. I mean, she's no negative. Her tumor was on, was it was a large tumor, T2. Um, and I think that's the one thing that gives me pause. And what one could do here is get the breast cancer index to see if this node negative patient actually falls into a higher risk category. Um, I think that that's, I, you didn't say whether she was pre or postmenopausal, but I think we now have some premenopausal validation of BCI. And so I have used that in patients I'm a little bit on the fence about and I guess the tumor size here is what's sort of making me think about that. Um, so uh, if she came back high on the BCI, then I would give her the choice of two or five years, um, given that she's tolerating the therapy well. I usually say, let's get to two years and then have another conversation uh, because things are changing. And, um, and we'll see how you're tolerating it. We'll see how your bones are tolerating it because it really is a risk benefit decision. And, and, and as you pointed out, for those with node positive disease, uh, the discussion uh, and decision is a little bit more clear, uh, but for uh, relatively younger women in, in this intermediate category, um, who themselves are kind of on the fence about doing everything possible to reduce the risk and balancing it against quality of life um, gets a little bit tricky. Um, Dr. Pratt, what are your thoughts on this? Well, as you pointed out, it's a tricky situation. I think requires a lot of uh, discussion no, with, with patients. Of course, these are patients that usually, you know, for for a long period of time, right, in general, uh, because you've been following uh, that patient for, for several years. So you know no, much about the her lifestyle and also how the, the, the treatment is affecting. Uh, so in that regard, I think it's a, it's a discussion about pros and cons. And again, the, the evidence is, is what it is. But again, I think what, what has been previously, previously said, if we can have tools no, to really indicate uh, extended endocrine therapy, uh, it's great, not positive disease, uh, BCI. But in some instance, it's true that uh, we're in the gray zone where it's, it's about discussing uh, pros and cons. It's also true that endocrine therapy also has uh, benefits regarding potentially preventing an, a new a new breast cancer. So again, there's, there's different things that needs to be discussed. And again, I think both decisions are, are fine. 
So, so uh, as you were just talking about, um, would uh, right. would one consider using CTS five as a simpler tool um, to estimate risk? It's um, a lot more robust in postmenopausal women than in pre, but uh, again, doesn't require uh, tissue and uh, uh, any cost. Again, I mean, this is a, a difficult question to, to, to ask. I mean, in my opinion, I think we need to, to offer to the patient no, the most validated uh, biomarkers. Uh, this, if we can, of course, if we cannot, uh, we have other tools to estimate risk uh, somehow. But again, uh, we, need, we need to stick with the highest level of evidence. And CTS5 is one, but uh, I think we have others that have shown. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about prognosis, and this is one aspect and to make a decision, like not positive disease, right? Or even Oncotype or Mamaprin or, or Prosigna can help you define risk. The other one is prediction of benefit in, in this particular scenario. And in that regard, I think BCI has, has a lot of uh, data on that. So again, uh, it's all about uh, the highest level of evidence, but I know that sometimes in clinical practice, we cannot offer uh, what we want. Um, thank you. I think uh, we don't have any chat questions related to this particular topic, so we'll move on to the next case and, and then take more chat questions with that case. So this is a 58-year-old postmenopausal uh, patient who's undergone lumpectomy and sentinel lymph node biopsy for right breast cancer pathology. Uh, shows a three and a half centimeter grade three IDC. Two out of four sentinel lymph nodes are positive. No extra nodal extension. Uh, the disease is ERPR positive, HER2 negative. KI67 was 15%. An oncotype DX uh, score of 30. Uh, the patient receives uh, adjuvant uh, chemotherapy with anthracycline. Uh, that's anthracycline and taxane based. Um, and uh, now she's ready to start endocrine therapy. Um, so the questions are, uh, how would we treat her, AI alone, AI plus uh, abemaciclib, uh, uh, add uh, bisphosphonate on top of uh, both of those. Um, what is your general approach, uh, Angie? Uh, well, you know, this is the patient who we, we could think about using abemaciclib um, because she has positive nodes. Her KS67 is a bit borderline there, but the positive lymph nodes could get her in and the tumor size in terms of eligibility. Um, so we have approval for that in the United States. And so that is something to consider. And I think it really does come down, I mean, given the data from Monarch E, um, which seems to be holding up, but I think we still need longer follow-up. Unfortunately, you know, for a patient like this, she has to make that decision right now. So she can't wait for more data. Um, and so I do think this is, again, a very individualized discussion about uh, risks and benefits and about um, tolerability. And um, for a very motivated patient um, who would like to do, feel like she's doing everything, I certainly would consider a bemocyclib. I You didn't mention anything about her, um, her bone density I've been a little hesitant to give adjuvant bisphosphonate globally um, because I have a healthy respect for the side effects of those. And so, but often these patients do have some degree of osteopenia or maybe even borderline osteoporosis, at least in the United States, we seem to see a lot of that. Um, so bisphosphonate often will sort of give us a twofer in that we can preserve bone mass on the AI and potentially get some benefit. But these would all be discuss, you know, discussion of each of these above and over and above the AI alone is really about risk and side effects. I think, yeah, if I, if I can add, um, completely agree again with, with Angie. Uh, just, just regarding K67, uh, just a general thought that 15% is, uh, is what is here in, in the clinical history. But again, this is, this is very, this is a biomarker that is not highly reproducible and we need to consider so 15 percent might be 15 percent for the pathology that has evaluated this but for another one could be 20 25 and and this is something i think also to to point out that this is 
despite the approval, I understand that uh, because the trial was designed like that, we are looking at a, a biomarker that is not as standardized. So and again, we need to take all in consideration as Angie uh, pointed out. So I would not preclude this patient to receive uh, abemacyclib just because it's 15% and it's not 21%. Um, and then, you know, what antibody was used and which lab. And so those are all, all challenges with, uh, with KS67 testing. Yes. And um, um, at least for us, we haven't switched tests. Uh, fortunately, we were using the same antibody and kit that uh, uh, was part of the approval. But uh, I think the, that test requires a newer machine, which, you know, the institution would have to buy a brand new machine and put cost into it, which isn't going to happen. Um, and so I'm curious what others are doing. I mean, have have you all changed your K67 antibody or whatever your pathologists were doing? We continue to do that and use our best judgment. So I'm mean, yeah. here. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I, I can tell you that in I mean, in in my experience, even our our pathologies at our unit, despite the same staining, uh, mm -hmm. they don't they don't have the same uh, score. Uh, so just, just it, so it's not just about the technique, no, the analytical and the staining. It's just about the interpretation. Mm -hmm. Maybe I imaging can help, but uh, we have had a lot of experience with imaging and K67, and, and has not mm -hmm. been, I would say, quite good. So anyway, let's see the data. But again, I think overall, the uh, I don't know if you saw the, I think it was a, a, a review article or position article in JCO from from FDA, no. Uh, explaining you know, the, the reason behind right indicating this particular cut point. I think on one hand it's good that the FDA explains you know, what's going on in, in, inside and what are the, the reflections about the OS estimate. So, but again, I, I still am a little bit perplexed about uh, Key 67 in 2021 being used as a, as a biomarker to indicate the therapy when we, when we are in the era of precision oncology, which means again, precise biomarkers. Angie, you were going to uh, say something. I, I was just going to say that we weren't routinely doing KI-67 um, before this data came out. And so this has then raised that issue of should we start doing it? Um, so, you know, I think I share all of the concerns that this is notoriously difficult to get right. And um, so we've been looking at just trying to, trying to adopt the same strategy, the same methodology as was used in the trial so that we can... Uh, have this opportunity to think about offering this to patients uh, who wouldn't fit the criteria in any other way. But I think here it's easier when you ha already have the stage to get you there. So I think if the same patient had a lower oncotype score, uh, so um, we wouldn't have prescribed chemotherapy, would that change uh, the recommendations regarding uh, the CDK46 inhibitor use? in your mind? Uh, I, I really wish we knew the answer to that question. Um, <laughs> we don't have any data to guide us. Uh, but, um, you know, you do, I do believe biology, right? And, and, and in so many ways, the Taylor X and our expander trials have really shown us that biology is what matters more than stage. And so I'm hesitant to overtreat a patient, particularly given toxicity if overall the prognosis is good. Um, but we just don't have the data to know whether the oncotype should be factored in in this situation um, with regard to making these decisions. The, the fact that you the, the patient wouldn't have received chemotherapy, would that be a simpler thing to factor in and, and make a decision? Um, well, clearly the, 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 the risk is higher, right? So the benefit reduction is really highly dependent on how high the risk is. So I think you know, and somebody whose oncotype is telling me that their risk is, uh, you know, the, the risk of a score of 30 is going to be much higher. Um, that's going to make me think I want to do more uh, to try to protect this person. Whereas as the score comes down and the overall prognosis improves, the incremental benefit that you're going to get from each therapy gets smaller and smaller. And then it, the risk plays a bigger role. So if we switch to local therapy for this uh, um, individual, a uh, little bit different than the first case, uh, uh, older patient, a uh, little bit older, but you know, two, two nodes that are positive, uh, 
And uh, we can discuss both scenarios, a higher oncotype and a lower oncotype. And I'd like to hear from our uh, radiation oncologists how they would approach local therapy for her. I think similarly here, most people would offer this patient regional nodal irradiation, which would then drive the longer um, course of therapy. Um, I think the oncotype just sort of adds to the um, sense that they might have a higher local failure rate and therefore maybe more likelihood of benefit from the regional nodal irradiation or the radiation in general. Um, and that also they may get more, that what MA20 and EORTC studies for regional nodal irradiation suggest is that radiation can have a systemic benefit that's independent of the local control in this low risk population. Um, and so that oncotype also kind of adds to the idea that this may be a patient who benefits from that. There's still small, measure, small uh, measurable differences. And so if the patient herself said, you know, the risks of that are not something that I want to pursue, including the arm swelling and all those kinds of things, then this is a patient who could have maybe a high tangent type approach, include the low axilla, get as much of the tangent as you can, and there begin to think about whether or not the hypofractionated regimens could come into play. And I think most people here would use what we now consider standard hypofrax, so three weeks with a boost or three weeks with an integrated boost, something like that. I think, um, Dr. Steckline, what would, what would your group do? I agree completely. I, I'll often use kind of the nomogram tools to risk stratify these patients into kind of a lower or higher risk. And I expect she would probably be on the kind of lower end of the high risk group and, and would probably be inclined to at least offer comprehensive treatment. Um, but for sure, high tangents if she's somebody who is okay with being somewhat less aggressive to avoid toxicity. And, and if, with a score of 30, you would be more enthusiastic about those recommendations as opposed to a score of 22? Um, with a score of 30, again, she would not be eligible for MA39. Um, with a score of 22 after the recent amendment, she would be. Um, and, and so that's another consideration is to talk about um, randomization. Again, in the, the breast conserved setting, um, she will get whole breast radiotherapy regardless. The trial does not allow high tangents, so you um, can't raise the superior border of your field to deliberately cover the low axilla. Um, so that's one additional kind of consideration is I think most radiation oncologists, if you have low volume axillary node disease that's been managed only with a sentinel node biopsy, will deliberately cover kind of the lowest part of the axilla. Um, you would have to be comfortable for going that treatment if you were to enroll this patient on MA39. Uh, there's a question from the audience about uh, adjuvant bisphosphonate. If if that was prescribed, uh, would one recommend it every three months or every six months? And and what's the optimal duration? Oh, well, I was just typing an answer to that, Priyanka. So um, I think you know, based on the guidelines we have from ASCO. Um, and others that if we are using it as adjuvant therapy alone, then um, I think you can go as few as three years. Uh, however, since so many patients have low bone density, often end up keeping them on it the entire time they're on their AI. And we typically use it every six months rather than every three months. Um, how about you, Dr. Pratt, in terms of adjuvant bisphosphonate, what are the general practices uh, um, for you? Yeah, very similarly as Anje pointed out, we use we use zoledronic acid uh, when we use it uh, every six months, usually minimum three years, and usually we, we extend it depending on the on the bone density. Thank you. So we'll move on uh, to our next case. So this is a sixty-eight year old uh, woman with uh, screen detected a small T one C. Grade two breast cancer in the upper outer quadrant of right breast. She undergoes a lumpectomy with central lymph node biopsy. Mm -hmm. Final pathology, it's a 1.6 centimeter cancer um, with associated DCIS. Uh, the closest invasive and inside two margins are both three millimeters. Uh, there's no LVI and all three central lymph nodes are negative. Uh, she is planning to take adjuvant aromatase inhibitor after discussion with her medical oncologist. Um, what type of local therapy would you recommend for this patient? Yeah, this is a great case. Um, 
Certainly you could talk to the patient about the data for observation from prime two. Um, and that again is a risk benefit um, conversation about their sort of longevity, their parents' longevity, their general health, the um, sort of personal risk aversity about the uh, increased in breast recurrence if you do observe, but the likelihood that that could be managed. Um, and then this is a patient who has a lot of easy options that come into that conversation as you're looking at observation. It's not really observation versus six weeks, certainly. And it doesn't even really have to be observation versus three to four weeks. Um, so this patient could have whole breast um, for three weeks. I feel like if you could do nothing, you probably don't need a boost. So I'd give three rather than four to somebody who wanted to pursue that fractionation, but there's lots of randomized data now that a partial breast radiation option would be completely fine. Many different regimens for that. I would prefer to choose one that has 10 years of follow-up. So the Italian approach with IMRT would be great, looks wonderful, um, easy. That's five fractions every other day. At the same time, this is a patient who's well represented by the UK fast forward study that came out and was the topic of the debate at San Antonio, should everyone get five fractions? Um, and while that only has five years of data, this is a patient who is really well represented by that. For sure, if you can treat the whole breast with five fractions to 26 gray, you can treat the partial breast of five fractions with 26 gray, and likely that would skirt even the slight differences in breast edema and things like that. So. I think there are lots of options here, and I would probably recommend this patient have 26 gray and five fractions to the partial breast. I'm curious what Dr. Steckline thinks. I always try and offer observation as well. Again, the caveat being that they're more or less committed to five years of endocrine therapy in that setting. And if there are questions that they can't or won't tolerate it, then I think that's not an appropriate option for them. Um, we have, uh, I've used a ton of the um, Florence APBI for these types of patients. They find it very, very convenient. They have very good cosmetic outcomes. Um, I think we're still kind of transitioning into doing more five fraction whole breast, but this, uh, if there's any patient that I would offer it to, it's this exact patient. So uh, would this patient be eligible for the, the recently opened Deborah study or uh, is the tumor size her uh, no, so that they can be any T1 tumor. Um, so she would be eligible. Again, we'd have to have an oncotype, and that one requires a score of 18 or less, and that would be a, a very good option as well. Um, the nice thing about that trial is it does allow some of these shorter course, um, you know, partial breast options. It has not incorporated the, the fast forward approach yet, but you can offer the five fraction partial breast treatment to those patients, which makes it a, a nice option because then as Dr. Woodward said, they're not even necessarily committed to, you know, nothing versus three or four weeks of treatment. They're still a very nice short option for these patients. So uh, I think uh, Dr. DeMichel has been answering some questions about uh, what happens in our high-risk adjuvant setting when a patient is a BRCA carrier and also uh, eligible for uh, I've been a sick live, uh, and uh, we're going to start seeing that in clinic. And uh, I know, and you provided a very nice response to that in the chat, but I'd like to hear some more comments uh, from both you and, and Dr. Pratt about that. Well, I will say, I think we're, we're in a difficult situation for both in the ER positive setting where we have the, in a, in a, germline mutation carrier, the options for both a CDK4-6 inhibitor and a LAPRIP. And then in the triple negative situation where we have a LAPRIP, we have capecitabine, we have immunotherapy for patients who have residual disease. And of course, all these trials were done independently, just testing the one intervention. And so what we, crit what we don't have and what we really need here would be data on what is the additivity uh, the added benefit, if you get take one, how much more benefit do you get if you add others? And what would be the right order, right? And so we're really left having to um, think about what we think is the greatest priority for a patient. Some of these, we do have uh, combination safety data. So for a very high-risk patient, for example, um, you know, I would go ahead and give um, Alaparib and immunotherapy for a triple negative patient, because we know that we can give those two together. I mean, we don't have really data on 
uh, alaparib and um, and abemocyclib. I mean, I don't think they would, uh, you know, the toxicity would be overlapping, but I don't know that. There's definitely myelosuppression with both of them. You're giving them for a long period of time continuously. So the problems with, you know, low white count, um, anemia, those would be significant potentially. So, you know, there you're really having to make a decision. And typically I will choose the PARP inhibitor over anything else for a germline mutation carrier, given how strong that data is, how really impressive um, the, the benefit is. So that's been my approach. Only in the most high risk cases in the triple negative side have I combined. How about you, Dr. Pratt? Dr. Pratt. Yeah, very difficult uh, decision, and I agree with Angie's uh, comment. I think for ER positive disease uh, in a patient with a germline BRCA1 or BRCA2, especially these high risk patients, uh, it's a very difficult uh, decision, and the two options have a significant data, clinically relevant data, but it's true that the combination should not be used. So the question is what, what to do. So here again, it's, it's a discussion of pros and cons. Of course, I think hopefully if we get some OS uh, data soon, I think that that could help because I would definitely favor uh, a drug that has, even if it has a, a hint over OS uh, benefit over, over uh, just um, yeah, invasive disease-free survival. So again, difficult. One could argue that abemocyclib has shown always data in the metastatic setting, whereas olaparib uh, has, has not. So that could be one argument. But again, I think we are in a setting that we, we don't have right answers here. Um, um, and the the Olympia, the follow up is a little bit longer, so it's close to four years. And uh, uh, I think we will see the OS data soon at the next meeting. So that can definitely help us. Yeah make those decisions uh, with our patients and and uh, uh, the regulatory approvals and availability for both drugs is also going to, uh, in some ways, dictate uh, what we're able to offer to our patients uh, in this setting. Um, uh, even though Olaparib is not approved, we've been able to prescribe it in the adjuvant setting and it has uh, uh, been okay, um, but, uh, Certainly, if we start prescribing two drugs together, that, that definitely would raise eyebrows uh, with our insurance carriers. So um, if we can move uh, to the next case, there might be a blank slide in between. Uh, okay, so this is a 58-year-old with HER2 negative, uh, ER pair positive metastatic breast cancer, bone-only disease, which developed eight months after stopping adjuvant AI. Uh, so she received first-line treatment with fulvestrant and CDK4-6 inhibitor with good disease control for about 12 months, now has progressive bone disease and has developed a few pulmonary nodules. Uh, the tumor tissue testing uh, shows a PIK3CA mutation. Uh, and how would you use that information to choose the next line of therapy? Um, and their potential options are listed here. Of course, there's other options that can uh, that are also available. Uh, on would there be any additional aspects of tissue genomic testing uh, that would be helpful in this uh, decision making, um, like ESR1 mutation? Well, yeah, Alex, maybe. Alex, you yeah, can maybe. That one, that one, I feel like I've been monopolized. Yes, <laughs> definitely, definitely. So, well, I think alpelisib here is is a, a reasonable option because of the of the PIK3C mutation. Here, I would point out that I would like to know which PIK3C mutation are, are we talking about because I think this is another aspect to, to highlight, right? As we are using these um, uh, multi gene panels that include even for PIK3C, they include all exons that are covered, um, are a little bit different from the solar one assay being used, which covered uh, the most prevalent mutation, but still I would like to know that this is a, a common exon 9 or exon 20 uh, mutation. This is one thing to, to come in here. But I think alpelisib is a good option. The, the question is what endocrine uh, partner uh, to use. I think now we have data, uh, not only from Polar 1, which was, was full Western, but now with belief that you can combine alpelisib with other endocrine therapy partners, not just full Western. Uh, of course, the ESR1 mutation uh, could help, but this patient has already received full Vestran, so maybe this ESR1 mutation comes from the adjuvant setting when the patient was receiving adjuvant AI that this ESR1 mutation occurred. So anyway, I, I, I would feel 
probably more comfortable to change the endocrine partner, not, not continue with, with full Vestran. Um, but again, if there is an ESR1 mutation, the, I think here it's fair to, to say that maybe maybe an AI is not doing is not doing much. I always try to delay the use of chemo in, in these patients. I know capecitabine is a is a is a chemo that is usually well well tolerated. That could be another good option. But if I can try, I, I I'll try to delay capecitabine a little bit a little bit longer. Yeah, I mean, I fully agree. I think that this is a little tricky just because the patients already had the full restraint and. Although we don't really have like strong level one evidence about the use of ESR1 to guide our endocrine therapy, it does seem like there's a really an accumulation of observational data now to show that those patients are just not going to respond so well to an AI. And so, and given that the patient was on fulvestrant and the CDK46 inhibitor, we don't know if uh, which drug, you know, is she is. What is she fully resistant to and what that resistance mechanism is. Um, so she might still be sensitive to the fulvestrant to some extent uh, if we add the alpelisib. Um, but I do tend to like to change both if I can. Um, but if there's an ESR1 uh, mutation present, I probably would not go to the AI and just continue the fulvestrant with the alpelisib. And um, I would agree that, you know, both of those might be nicer options and save the cape cytobine uh, for a little bit later. Although I will say also that, you know, one could go later after the next line back to potentially single agent abemocyclib, which uh, there's also some small series suggesting activity there. And I've definitely seen it anecdotally in patients who progressed on a CDK4-6 inhibitor earlier got a break from it. And there is preclinical data as well suggesting that the tumors are dynamic and switch from uh, cyclin D to cyclin E and can switch back. And so um, multiple options here for this patient to help put off chemotherapy a little longer. Uh, and, you know, um, are there any trials that are looking at the, some of the novel surge and um, pediatric kinase inhibitors uh, in this setting? Yeah, I mean, this is the area that's really ripe for research. There's just, we don't have good, strong um, strategies that are based on what is actually happening in that patient's tumor. That's what we need. We need, a, you know, probably a platform, large platform trial where we can try to match the mechanism of resistance to the next therapy that a patient takes to see if that improves their long-term outcomes. Short of that, we're kind of guessing. Um, there was a question about whether uh, Affinitor um, also could, should be in here. And I, I keep it in my in the mix uh, of endocrine therapies um, because I, I really had good luck with it. In the patients who respond and using the SWISH protocol, you can avoid the, the mouth sores. I think it got kind of a bad rap up front initially because people got such terrible mucositis, mm -hmm. but that is completely avoidable now using the um, steroid mouthwash. And so I do keep that in my rotation before going to chemotherapy. And there are patients who have gotten really great responses to that as well. Dr. Pratt, I'll ask you the last question in terms of uh, the very important point that uh, uh, Angie brought up. You know, we don't know what's happening in these tumors as they go through different endocrine options and, and different uh, mutations uh, emerge uh, versus not. So um, are you doing any active work? I, I, I know we've seen all the uh, all the data from the uh, Mona studies, but that was all baseline. Are there any opportunities to look at subsequent samples to see subtypes of switching? What is happening? Can can we learn from that? Totally, and I, and I do think this is the this is the area where all we, we should be putting a lot of a lot of effort. Uh, we really need to understand what is the biology of these of these tumors that progress to CDK for six inhibitors. And endocrine therapy. We are currently running uh, uh, a couple of trials in this particular setting using biology uh, in tumor samples from metastatic samples. Uh, for example, we have a trial called the TATEN, which hopefully we will present at ESMO, uh, which we are focusing on the HER2 enriched after CDK46 inhibition, because this is a subtype 
that as we're seeing, it's it's prevalent and even becomes higher its prevalence after CDK from six inhibition. And at the same time, we see it's a subtype that is immune inflamed. So potentially strategies of chemo with anti-PD-1 could be, could be of value in a subset of patients. We're talking about 15 to 20, 25% of the patients after CDK front 6 inhibition. Overall, what we're seeing, and I think the data with the certs, no, like I think the MLL data shows that we, we are focusing, or we are seeing a, a mixed population, tumors that are still luminal, some that are, has switched to non-luminal. So definitely, as Angie was pointing out, we need like a platform, we need to biopsy, but at the same time, we know the complexity of biopsying all the time. So we need to find ways to to capture these these phenotypes, maybe in plasma or in other in other settings. Because whereas in lung cancer, no, we can find single mutations and maybe drugs have high efficacy. I think in in breast, we really need to look at the phenotype. So that for that we need tissue, and that's the issue <laughs> uh, right now, especially in the metastatic setting. So we really need to, need to do the strategy. But I do think we're going to change the way we treat patients once we understand more the biology after CDK front six inhibition. So with those forward-looking thoughts and words, uh, um, this concludes our uh, meeting for today. I want to uh, thank uh, for all our uh, faculty members for such active uh, discussion and multitasking, answering questions uh, live and on chat at the same time. Um, so I, I know our audience and participants uh, uh, greatly appreciate uh, uh, all of that.